Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome to the September 28th, 2017 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Ordinance Committee. Uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, Councillor St. Clair present here with Councillor Donovan. Uh, Councillor Rowan is reputed to be three or four minutes away. So we'll uh, uh, adjust the agenda a little bit to uh, accommodate uh, his uh, arrival. Uh, we'll start with the uh, minutes of August 23 and September 7, 2017. Do I have a motion? Yeah, move approval. Okay, I'll second that. Any edits or changes? I did not see any. No. I didn't see any issues. All Either one of them. All in favor, unanimous. Uh, we'll skip uh, item, the next item, uh, since I want uh, Will to be here okay. when we talk about the affordable yes. housing in lieu fee you momentarily take up the discussion on editing ordinances for gender neutral provisions okay. uh, look to the assistant yeah. town manager to address us on that sure so um, can, you, can you go there just because they won't be able to hear you Thanks, Jay. planning is always here to help thank <laughs> you um, so yeah so our ordinances are great in many, many ways, but they do not allow for a female fire chief or a female tax assessor or a female town manager. And so I have just gone through them all and um, made it so that our language reflects the reality of today's world, which is that women are allowed to be in any of those positions. Um, so I did not make them gender neutral. I did not just de-gender all of them, and so I was going to kind of find out from you guys if that was okay with you. I've simply made them gender equal. So an example would be, um, I printed out the shortest one I could find, the Property Tax Assistance Ordinance. And that one has, um, if the tax assessor determines that the applicant is eligible to participate in the program, he shall determine the amount of the benefit paid. And all I've done is I've added a slash and the word she. So that would be an example of the sort of edits um, that I'm suggesting. And um, They've just been straight up, so I have a phone call in to Phil Saucier to see if there's a way, if council wishes to, to address all of them in one bulk batch instead of having yeah. a separate public mm -hmm. hearing on each one to change the word mm -hmm. he to he, she, and him to her, him, and um, those are all the changes that were made. They're not substantive. Great, great. Uh, discussion ar around this. Oh, I mean, for me, it's a no-brainer. It's an easy, easy fix, and probably should have done been done a long time ago. But um, I think in the past, it's always just been we, we obviously wouldn't have not let someone take that position because our ordinance said he, and it had to be a he because we have some that are female, like mm -hmm. HR. I'm sure the HR one probably says he, and we had a female HR person so I mean to me it's not a big deal so mm -hmm. I would say have at it and mm -hmm. I it would be per my personal preference done in one mm -hmm. bulk setting because I do not want to sit through 40 um, ordinances because of a he she situation right. uh, I completely agree with Councilor St. Clair's remarks uh, I don't really have an opinion whether it's he slash slash she or it's the uh, we'd be repeating for that man or a police woman <laughs> i don't i don't i don't have an opinion on that uh do you have a preference do you think there's one no i i i have set them up like i said to be gender equal so that wherever it says he that now says he she um the alternative would be to simply that would take a little bit more wordsmithing which is a bit more um so instead of Oh, I see. So avoiding time. pronouns would be yeah. making them gender neutral. Right. So it's a question of which level you wanted to go with, and I think that if that's entirely your choice. Simple. Simple is good. <laughs> okay. Jinx. Then they are all. They are all. Um, I've gone through all of the ordinances that I found for the town, and there were maybe 30 to 40 that had gendered language in them, and those have all been um, amended to reflect. Um, gender equality, and as soon as we heal back from the lawyer, then we can figure out how to make those a batch thing, but I have not heard Okay, back so w w is your uh, recommendation that we come back at the next ordinance committee meeting with clearance from our town attorney on uh, how to handle the whole batch? Yep, we're just looking for the kind of how to write that order. 
so that okay. there's a, an ability to just vote on it in one go. And okay. I called him last week. Um, maybe he's enjoying this gorgeous weather, but I will t try to get in touch with him tomorrow um, or at least send another round of email and voicemail. Is it necessary to come back to us for that purpose, or what do you think, Tom? No, Can't we just send it to the council? Yeah, I, I with think the you've, you've been pretty clear that you'd like to do it as one batch, a kind of omnibus action, yeah. and if we're able to accomplish that, uh, I think we could pass it on, do it on the future mm -hmm. council agenda. If it's different, mm -hmm. we'll bring it back to you. Yeah. Good. I, I think that's uh, uh, Councilor Rowan just arrived, just very timely. Uh, we just we just we moved an item up, which was the editing all of our ordinances to make them gender neutral. Oh, great. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I know you would join Councilor St. Clair and me in uh, supporting that. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll and I'll accept a motion to uh, move this to the town council. So moved. Second. Okay. Any dis further discussion? No. All in favor? Good. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting. I saw a, um, I went to a, a, a film festival uh, a few weeks ago in Martha's Vineyard, and they had a film uh, on Switzerland, uh, and it told the story of how in 1971 they held a referendum in which Switzerland finally voted to give women the vote. And it wasn't until 19, and that was the federal, at a federal level. And it wasn't until 1991 that all of the states of Switzerland, the canons as they call them, uh, actually officially uh, allowed women to vote. So extraordinary. As of, as of two days ago, women can drive in Saudi Arabia. Yes. Yeah. So that was quite a thing. Some remarkable things happening. Right, progress. Sadly, uh, there aren't many that would miss the chance of doing it, but. Come. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the one we skipped over, which is a discussion on restrictions on the use of affordable housing uh, in lieu fees. Uh, and I think we'll start with the planning director uh, and Council Rowan. Uh, you want to start by giving a little bit of a background on how this came to be before us, and then we'll ask the town planning director to, yeah, to. to address it. Yeah, so uh, we were in the affordable housing committee um, uh, meeting and we were um, talking about the ordinances that we had on the books for use of the um, of the fee and how um, when we were trying to um, draft our recommendations to the town council for the use of the um, the funds that would be coming from Gateway Commons uh, and um, one of the things that we noticed was one of in there is, are a number of restrictions on the, on what the funds cannot be used for and of those things are um, to build, they cannot be used to assist in the building of the, um, of the affordable units that are required if you accept the density bonus. And it, it, so the, the idea is that if you take the density bonus as a developer, your responsibility is to build those, those units. And so that's our, that seems pretty reasonable. Um, and what we observed was that it didn't make mention of um, it, our single inclusionary zone in town, which is the Crossroads District, um, which says that if 10% um, of the houses there must be affordable. And so the, uh, the thought is that that again would be the responsibility of the developer if you're going to build units in that town, in that zone, excuse me, the, that the expectation would be that you would be um, also building the affordable units and these funds could not be used for that purpose. Um, and these, the, the idea of the of uh, the spirit of, as we understand it, on or as those of us present in the uh, on the Housing Alliance Committee at the time, uh, were that this was really to encourage new um, develop, development of affordable units. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Is that coming uh, yeah, up, the, Tommy? You were in the yeah. room. It does. I'm just yeah. trying to think back to uh, which document that that, right. that uh, sits in. I, I think, think it's, it's a zoning there. ordinance. That's our call. I believe it's, a, it's the creation of the Affordable Housing yeah, Initiative that's Fund. That's what I think. It's that language, and I, I just don't remember that. I don't believe it's an ordinance. I think it's a, uh, it's it's part of the order that created the reserve fund. So it's kind of a self-imposed uh, set of restrictions and or instructions as to what the money can account cannot be used for. Hmm. So I don't think it's an ordinance per se, but that's not to say that this isn't the right place to have the But one, it's enforceable. Right. Uh, and two, the spirit of it was to not subsidize affordable housing 
that uh, uh, where you're getting uh, a bonus, density bonus. Or you're required otherwise. Or no. otherwise required. Right. Right. Uh, our town manager, uh, town uh, planner, uh, Jake, any comments that you would like to make to further clarify this? Well, I'm really here more for as a resource. I wasn't part of the Housing Alliance conversations and uh, other than some brief emails uh, between uh, Councillor Donovan and Councillor Rowan, sort of catching up on the matter as well. Um, but so as a resource, I will just note that in the uh, zoning ordinance uh, under Section 7C, it, uh, CB5, it does actually talk about the new fees not being able to be utilized. Okay. So uh, it probably is in the reserve okay. account language, but mm -hmm. it is also in zone zoning Good. ordinance language as well. So just for, for density plan. for density bonuses for di for projects that are already getting a density bonus. Okay. Correct. Yep. And and so is it a reasonable parallel in your mind uh, uh, to not allow the use of these funds? To, uh, that are in the reserve fund mm -hmm. to be used where you uh, uh, are getting a density bonus and the parallel to the obligation of 10% in the Crossroads District. I don't know if I would use the term parallel necessarily. I think in the first scenario where it's a density bonus, there is a bonus that's being given to the developer, whereas they could have built perhaps 10, 10 market rate units the bonus is they might be able to now build 13 market rate units, but also have to build two affordable units. Let's just, you know, my numbers may be off, but you get the general gist here. Um, whereas in the crossroads, if they were allowed to build only 10 units of those, and actually I need to correct myself, in the crossroads, if you build 10 units or less, you don't have to do affordability. So let's use the number 20. 20. <laughs> Make life easier. If you're going to build 20 units, Four of those have to be affordable. So at that rate, then they're doing 16 market rates and four affordable. So it's it's Ten, a two. 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 Thank you. Yes. Uh, yep. Okay. Right. I've, yes. It's been get, a long get, week. Get I apologize. <laughs> well, we put you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Uh, one is you're getting rewarded uh, uh, with a, a density bonus, and right. then the other, it's obligatory. Correct. So that, that's why I say I don't see it quite as parallel. It is a little different, but um, certainly a, a policy decision to be made. Um, Good. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Of no, Jay? I, I'm, I don't have any questions for Good. Jay. I'm just more curious. I just want to be very clear on where Councillor Rowan stands with this. Oh, so uh, I, I was of the opinion that um, given that the obligation is there for the developer to build um, affordable units that we didn't need to provide further incentive. Um, I would. I agree with you. Yeah, and I, I agree with you too. I think uh, is the sense that uh, we should uh, uh, ask the town manager, assistant town manager, planning director to come back with language that would accomplish that goal. I mean, do you want to be instrumental in in crafting that language? I, I don't. I. I don't think I need to assist in the creation. Okay. I think it's. Per, I think we could add yeah. a sentence to the existing ordinance. Yeah, I think the language is quite quite simple. So we can certainly do that and bring back. And you can have your way with it. Yeah. Good. I, I, you know, I think obviously the. I don't think it creates any kind of perverse incentive that other than what's already there, which is mm -hmm. we're probably going to see a bunch of ten unit developments. But. Okay. Uh, 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 accept the motion to request staff to draft. Uh, language to amend the ordinance consistent with our consensus. Yes. Yeah, so, so moved. So Any further discussion? Second. All in favor? Good. Thank you. It, just to be clear, we know it exists in the zoning ordinance. Um, I'll look to see if, it, uh, if there's a parallel language that needs to be uh, married up with this uh, in another document of policy, perhaps. Okay. Good, good, good. Moving okay, on. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, tonight? Yes. 30 at the high school for yep. anyone watching? We, we, will, <laughs> we will be there. Just so uh, you know, Dan, uh, Jay's been uh, at and working with the team till past 11 the last two nights. The team has really been uh, working overtime just to, so we're all anxious to see what they come up with. I know. This is pretty exciting. Tonight. When If you've attended a few of these, 
uh, you get wrapped up in the uh, excitement that people have expressed for different ideas. So I'm looking forward to tonight. Next item on the agenda, the discussion and action on the noise issue related to the special amusement license and uh, good neighbor. Uh, we have draft language prepared by uh, the assistant town manager uh, that is before us uh, for consideration. And uh, this was the direction that we had at the last meeting to uh, edit the special amusement application fee to uh, more clearly identify noise issues. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll uh, open that up to discussion on the board. Okay. Kate? Um, I don't, one of the things that concerned me with this was um, what could possibly be a reason that someone would get an exemption from the good neighbor policy? It just worries me that. Yes, and I think it's probably uh, uh, within the, obviously the way it's set up, it's within the discretion of the town council to issue some exception or exemption right. Right. from the provision and in all likelihood set a new standard. Mm -hmm. uh, if, for instance, uh, you were uh, in a uh, remote area, mm -hmm. like a farm area, uh, in uh, western uh, West Scarborough uh, and you were going to have an outdoor concert uh, and it was going to be subject to nighttime hours so which is very restrictive presently right. uh, but yet there's there's no one within okay. a half a mile okay. just to pick a distance okay. uh, I could see how that would be I could see how uh, yeah. this would come up with the uh, speedway. Yeah. And I think that would probably be one of the first instances in which uh, we would have uh, have that issue because they're asking for uh, permits uh, for uh, fireworks. Those I mean... Are, those are special permits issued by the fire department. You know where I live, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can hear them. They've, like, shaken my house before. Your the, beach ridge? Oh, yeah, yeah, the fireworks from the beach ridge. And I'm a good, I'm like five, six miles away at least. Yeah. Would you say? You say less uh, than that? I'd say a little bit less, less than that. Less than that? I guess because I think about like going down around the corner. But um, so I guess that when you bring beach ridge up, it, that always makes me a little bit nervous. Uh, I see. Because um, I'm annoyed by the... Uh, you know, when I had little kids, that annoyed me because it woke my kids up all the time. But anyway, um, that's a different issue. So I just wanted to be clear, and and what and your answer um, mm -hmm. puts me at ease over that. Um, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't going to be a way to sort of, you know, their way in. Because I because we created that good neighbor policy for a reason. You know, and I want to make sure that it. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I, I think I hear what you're trying to say, and I think the the reason why we're we're going here is that what we're seeing is that there was some ambiguity as to whether the good neighbor ordinance applied if they had a special amusement right. permit. And I think what we're highlighting here is that it applies. Yeah. But if for some reason you need an exemption because we're seeing um, violations currently, right. enough, uh, that um, that you spell it out and yeah. and at least make the town council aware of what we're doing what when we grant you the special music per permit. And I guess the good part about that is if, we're, if by way of making the council aware of it, it's also in turn making the public aware of it. So then there isn't such a hoopla over if something happens and people hear it, mm. hopefully they had already gotten noticed by it. I mean, there's so many things, so many times like the newspaper picks it up or the TV picks it up or the Facebook picks it up or whatever. So. And that actually right, also point. makes me feel a little bit better. I just don't want to yeah. see all that work that went into that, put into that good neighbor policy. I don't want to see that get sucked away. Yeah, it's kind of bypassed. Right, yeah. Uh, uh, and I, but I do get it. I, and my, my expectation is 
that this will place a responsibility on the senior administrative staff of the town to make judgments as because what's going to come before us to the town council when those special amusement permits are subject to approval is a set of uh, restrictions that may uh, be different than the uh, noise ordinance, the good neighbor ordinance. Yeah. But it may vary as to hours. Yeah. It, uh, but that's going to be, uh, obviously we still have to approve whatever those conditions are that would make some limited exception. Okay. But that's how I see this working out. Yeah, the difference is that this form would require a request for an exemption and then a grant of that exception. And from the council. From the council. Presumably right. you would not grant it uh, unless there's some conditions that are acceptable to you and with input from abutters. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, some abutters may be more tolerant than others. Right. You know, you may allow music to occur till 10.30 at night on weekend nights. Right. And everyone in the neighborhood's fine with it. Right. But it's more idiosyncratic. You'll, you'll deal with them as they come and make decisions based on the circumstances. And, and just so that anyone watching uh, on uh, TV understands, we've received uh, an opinion from our town attorney that the noise ordinance does apply. Right. Notwithstanding that a special amusement permit is issued, it, that is still subject to the noise ordinance uh, with the proviso uh, in the noise ordinance said if we choose to modify it, the town council by vote chooses to modify it, it can do so. And, and this new application form for special amusement permits is now designed to ferret out those circumstances where uh, uh, there is a likelihood of non-compliance. And then we're going to try and work out those circumstances with exceptions that are respectful to all the neighbors because the neighbors in this uh, new form of application are being required to receive notice, right. uh, which is a significant development to give people the opportunity to give input back in writing and we've obviously tried to facilitate that with uh, uh, ease of emailing to town councilors uh, and the town manager. So, uh, these are significant changes. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone realized that the noise ordinance superseded and did control yeah. uh, special amusement permits. But uh, that's, that's the interpretation that we've gotten. We as an ordinance committee support that uh, based on the discussion that we've had. Uh, the option always exists that the town council could specifically exempt special amusement permits from uh, uh, compliance. But I think in this case, what we've done is a more nuanced application process to allow for those exceptions, but we really have to think through and receive a recommendation that we're prepared to accept. Yeah, please understand it's not, um, it's not me. I don't, I'm not trying to like kibosh anybody's fun. Um, because I want, you know, people to have, obviously we want people to have celebrations and have a good time and enjoy Scarborough. Um, it was more of just, uh, there was a lot of work that you did going into that and I didn't want to see, you know, any, anybody sneaking by with that. So, I'm good with it though. It's, I feel much better about it. Um, a question that comes up, because I, uh, I live probably ten miles from the Scarborough Speedway, mm -hmm. and I can hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess the question arises, uh, that's obviously well beyond the 200 foot yeah. requirement. Uh, uh, how does that all work? Uh, I don't know whether, they're, whether the, it would have a grandfathered status. Uh, generally speaking, uh, when towns adopt new ordinances, uh, people are required to uh, abide by the new ordinance. The, the concept of grandfathering generally does not apply. Uh, that's, that's a common interpretation of the law. There are some limited circumstances where grandfathering does apply. But that's something probably that we probably need to uh, address, not in this context, but separately. Yes, it strikes me that issue has more to do with a good neighbor ordinance than it does special amusement. I'm not aware that they unless there's a special exactly. need for it. But the, the noise you're talking about is 
clear and constant as a result of what they do up there. So I think yeah. it's more an issue um, regarding the Good Neighbor Ordinance. Yeah. As I recall, the, the noise provisions of the Good Neighbor Ordinance are not materially different than what they were before. We simply folded them in. Right. So I'm hoping That's true. things are going to stay fairly copacetic in that, yeah. in that sense. Yeah. And I think people have grown to kind of accept it is what it is. Um, we always know what it is. It's remarkable to me <laughs> I mean, that we don't get more complaints. Yeah. People seem to accept it. Um, uh, I certainly knew it was there when I bought my house, and I live half a mile from it. So yeah. <laughs> that's the crow flies. Uh, any amendments uh, to the uh, draft that uh, the assistant town manager has presented to us? I didn't have any. I, all I needed was clarification, and I'm good. Okay. I have no amendments. None? I like it. Okay. And, and uh, you do want the excerpt, um, the relevant noise? Yeah, portion. there is that one. Uh, element that we weren't quite clear the recommendation came forward I think from Will uh, to include the ordinance itself uh, and I'm wondering how people feel about uh, at first I looked at it and I said well maybe we could just have section 4b in but then when I read it I could see how uh, uh, an applicant for a special amusement permit should read the whole thing. Oh, yeah, I would. Yeah. It was. Yeah, it I mean, this isn't the whole thing, obviously, but I think it's all the relevant portions. I agree with Councilor yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, I think this is the, what we have there should probably stay. And I think, and I agree that it's the. And positioning relevant. is that is that uh, should it uh, come before uh, the approval signatures? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I wouldn't I wouldn't move it. I don't I don't think we need to move it. I think it's fine. Right where it is. Right where it is. It's uh, I'm sorry, shown, shown below. Meant, yeah. I thought you meant counselor signatures. Oh. I I I didn't realize you meant the signatures um, up above of the applicant. Um, I mean, I'm fine with with where the layout of is. It is. You're okay with it. I mean, it, technically, if we're asking them to sign something, then it. In an agreement of something, I would think that it would need to be above where they're signing. Yes. That's just my personal opinion. Like if I'm reading a document and I'm and I sign something and then there's another piece underneath it, in my head I might go, Oh well, I didn't sign that. I didn't sign to agree to that. So there is language. Does that, that makes sense. It makes sense to me, but I think I think it's I think we're covered because we, the the new language says including the good neighbor ordinance applicable sections shown below. And then Perfect. Above, and that's and it, it's it, it immediately Fine. follows the signature of the applicant. And most importantly, uh, what does appear before the applicant's signature is their formal request. So presumably, that's the most important part for you to know. Right. We're not asking them to sign off or do anything with respect to the good neighbor no. ordinance. It is right. what it is. We're just putting it there as a reference for them. That's right. good. That's a good point. The request for the exemption from the good neighbor ordinance appears above the signature. Yes, and I think that's the most important part. Is there then maybe now I'm just being annoying and um, <laughs> sorry. Is there any way to just put in a, a line where they initial it, with acknowledging that they read that? If they don't ask for a request, they're not going to be granted a request, and therefore I think yeah. it's at their own peril. Okay. Probably a probably a redundancy. Yes. Um, right. Except a motion uh, uh, to uh, pass to this is it's kind of strange. Uh, we could craft a it's kind of a unique order. Mm -hmm. It's not an ordinance. It would be an order amending the application for special use and purpose or something like that. Okay. So right. this this is the document that would go to council. Except uh, except a motion. Yeah. So moved. Second. Good. Further discussion? All in favor? Good. Thank you. Oof. Moving right along, aren't we? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, were you also going to take up another matter on your agenda? We didn't put it on the agenda, but related to the uh, garbage and recycling collection, the... the, the uh, yeah, I think we were going to uh, uh, have it uh, be as the last item uh, uh, substantive item. Agenda? It's, it's, on on, it's on the one that's um, being distributed. It's on. It's on. Yeah. It's on it's I have a little. Uh, fine. 
I yeah. have an old version. My, my yeah, mind. my mine's old too. I okay. have a pen. Yeah. I have a pen. Yeah, I got to. Uh, I got to Tracy late on that. It's, okay. And it's online. Okay. Good so topic. the next item is discussion of public parking lot passes, and we have uh, uh, Todd Souza here to uh, uh, give us an update on his work uh, and a schedule that looks like uh, the product of your efforts to identify recommended pricing for a number of things. Sure, uh, thank you. And um, yeah, I put that together. It shows on the left-hand side the schedule um, that's present. And then based on some of the other conversations we've had, I just thought I'd put kind of um, addressing the 2018 perspective fees, obviously that everything has to go through, but based on some of the recommendations I mentioned before, um, a couple of things working through this, I think there's a couple of things that, that tie with, with the schedule of this and also the fees that will be associated with it, which then relate to what type of gate systems we choose. So questions that I have moving forward, when we can review these fees in a second, but it's kind of first of all deciding what our season is going to look like. Are we staying in a present season where it's going to be uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day? Are we looking at a some shoulder seasons has been talked of? Are we talking about having a a May to October charge season. To, um, what is our charging schedule going to look like? Are we going to do hourly? Are we going to do our flat fees? Kind of, are we going to do? We're doing a combination, um, and then other other communities. And we've had some conversation with the clerk about do we limit the number of certain passes based on some of our challenges with parking at the boat launch and co-op areas. Um, I've researched a lot of different meters. Uh, I shouldn't say a lot from two basic prime companies, but there's, there's really four kind of configurations we can use. We can use kind of what we're presently doing. Um, we can have fully automated systems that you, you get a receipt, you go out, you pay, and that can be timed or flat, uh, and those do accept season passes. It can be a combination gate where uh, it's a time gate at 5.30, the gates go up, you pay a parking meter station like we have at Bayview. Um, and and then at 9 o'clock the gates come down and whoever's in is in. Uh, just like if the um, Black Point Inn was closing the gate behind you at 9, presently at Higgins. Um, you know, or there's slight combinations of those. There are some different meters that um, check in, check out, but the pay station's off to the side. Just now with PCI compliance, it's about an 8 to a 12 second in and out based on using your chip now. Mm -hmm. And so all the machines are pretty much PCI compliant, which is important to us. Um, so based on how we're going to charge and length of the season, it's kind of going to dictate where I kind of lead us into different meter systems, um, because we need some return on our on our on our investment. How long it's going to take to pay those back, and then truly, what are we trying to accomplish by putting meters? And it's not presently it's proposed at Higgins, but how it could affect our Ferry Beach operation, how it could affect our Herd Park, uh, Pine Point Beach operation. Um, so those are considerations that I think um, we need to consider um, regarding boat launch and, and um, rec piers. I am attending, I believe it's on October 10th, the um, Coastal Waters and Shellfish Committee meeting to kind of get their feelings on some of these fees that we're proposing. Um, everything there is no impact to residents. It's all about uh, our impact and our influx of non-residents of other communities have either restricted, removed, or increased fees. We're seeing growth, which provide challenges to our parking facilities and areas presently. So um, what you see there on that chart in green are just strictly recommendations where, um, for example, the first one, presently right now, 5.30 to 9 in the morning, we don't charge. There's nobody there. So if you had a gate system or a metered system, you could charge a flat fee or an hourly fee based on whatever preference we have. Um, the other fees of recommendation going down was our season parking pass to the beaches for a non-resident. Presently at 75, proposing moving to 100, which still keeps us in the ballpark of other communities. Um, same thing with the season non-resident boat launch pass. Presently 50, looking to move to 75. Um, for a point of clarification so there's not confusion, that next section on that chart where it talks about recreational peer use and commercial peer use, um, those are the fees that are presently being charged. 
and there's no delineation with resident or non. So that's why you see them as the same fee. And then if you move down to that last section um, in talking with Todi, um, and just for clarification, um, if you've had a mooring, you've had to pay a peer fee. And so I just combined the two fees there so people knew that. Like it wasn't written where you had to have one and then the other. So I just put the combination together. And those are those 2017s are what that combination fee is. And then on the right was just me combining those two fees just for a point of conversation. So to kind of know what that schedule could look like. Uh, thank you, Todd. Uh, we, of course, were interested in the uh, season pass, yep. but that also raises, you know, what your plans obviously are for um, hourly parking. You've got a new, you're funded to get a metered system. Yeah, gated. Metered uh, gated system, yep. electronic system at uh, the Higgins Beach parking lot. Correct. With the idea that if the bugs work, are worked out, you would be able to extend that as the years follow right. to Heard Park uh, and Ferry Beach. Right. Uh, uh, I would like to be able to see the hourly rate charged kept as low as possible, but since I'd like to be able to either make it revenue neutral or ex extend the revenue, the uh, expansion of hours and the expansion of season uh, is of interest to me mm -hmm. uh, because I do think that it will allow us to spread the cost of maintaining these beaches uh, over more people uh, and there's substantial right. out of town usage so it will allow a contribution on their part right. to, uh, to the cost to maintain our beaches. There's two factors to consider. One is um, talking to both the primary manufacturers of these, we're not going to see a great reduction in staff costs. Um, most of the metered parking lots you see across the country have some sort of staff there because they're dealing with um, maintenance, cleaning the restrooms, just managing patrons, that sort of stuff. We may be able to shift the hours or reduce them in certain areas, but it won't eliminate them completely. Um, those morning and late operations, uh, or even days like this weekend, if we had an extended season at 90 degrees, Bird Park probably turned over two times. Um, and so those are opportunities to gather, even with a pay station. Um, that's why I think one of the considerations is those shoulder seasons or just a complete season where you say, for example, May to October, because then we could decide whether we're going to staff it with, with staff in combination to a meter or just go with the meter system based on what the weather may be. or because um, presently we're making that decision on a daily basis. If it's raining, we don't send staff down. Right. But the meter could still collect if that's the case. Where, where do you stand as far as lengthening the hours and lengthening the days? Um, well, I, I think if we lengthen the hours, I think what's going to the cause and effect is going to be is driving more people to season passes. And that's why I think limiting the number of non-resident is a consideration on how many we sell potentially. Because yeah. I think once we raise these fees, people are going to be leaning towards season pass if we get into hourly rates. Um, I don't have any parking data. We have passes daily sold, but nothing during those time frames that say from 5.30 to 9, we average 30 cars a day for 60 days. We don't have any of that traffic right now, studies. So what that cause and effect is going to be is, you know, I don't know that. Good. Um, and so my question related more to the other consideration, which is the enforcement. Would the staff that's there be able to write, for instance, parking tickets if if need be, or do, would that be an additional, like we'd have to have police officers come down? I mean, presently at Higgins, there is there is um, reserve officers there, and that's why I think that the gate system, again, you're going to have to get in, but to get out, you're going to have to pay, depending on the system, or if it's an open gate with a meter, that becomes a greater challenge to enforcement. If the gates go up at 530 and, let's say, come it down nine automatically, then we're leaning on our law enforcement to check parking and, and that sort of stuff. So, um, And that would be the same um, at all the facilities if that's what we so charge. It strikes me if for the parking lot, and Higgins Beach is unique in that there's interest early morning and late night. Um, so to Councilor Donovan's point, keeping that hourly rate reasonable 
uh, such that someone can come for an hour and a half or two and mm. wouldn't mind shelling out two and a half bucks or three bucks. You know, that's not we not, may not be forcing people to buy seasons pass because they can really pick and choose what they want to do. Um, but if it's hourly, it strikes me that you're going to have to pay on the way out because not all parkers will be equal, right? Um, right. They'll be issued a ticket on the way in. It's very quick, uh, right. eight or ten second transaction, um, and then they feed that ticket in as they go out. It says, okay, you've been here 90 minutes. You owe us whatever it is. I don't, a max. I don't understand what you mean by there's more interest at Higgins Beach for morning and late night. Well, I, sh I should say, uh, unique, yeah, fair enough, but there are some unique things. The, the surfing attraction at Higgins is unique. Uh, the fishing issues, are not issues, but attraction is unique in mm -hmm. my opinion. Uh, a lot of early morning folks uh, are either surfing or fishing at, at Higgins. I'm just really, I'm really uncomfortable imposing something at one beach and not imposing it at another. Well, I'm just observing that not all beaches react uh, act the same, and I think there's some unique things. The basic I don't think what you're talking systems about systems will be the same, but we may uh, it may operate slightly differently. I, I think the 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 issue is this is a bit of a guinea pig year, right? Uh, so uh, I had never thought once we had metered systems at all three beaches that we treat any of the beaches differently. Yeah, I, I, I well, would think I'm saying that the, the use is different, uh, for instance. And the use is different, there's no question. High tide is no beach, so on very few days would you ever have the occasion to park there for six hours or you know, for a full day. Uh, it would be a, a real unique circumstance where the weather is right, the tide is right, and you're able to be there for an extended period. Hmm. So that's one of the benefits of people you know, able to come and go at their schedule. Um, whereas at Pine Point Beach, no matter of the tide schedule, there's beach to sit on. So presumably people, and they do, are there for the full day. Right. So there's just differences that we need to appreciate. No, and I, I please, I, I, I understand that. I just don't, I, I can just see that, you know, we always get kicked back from the, from the beach community no matter what beach we're at. But I just think that whether or not they attract different people, they should still be charged the same amount. Sure. No, for instance, you may I say agree. it would be the same hourly charge and there's maybe a daily limit. So it's a dollar and a half, I'm just throwing numbers right. out, right. per hour, uh, no more than $10. Right. So for the person that wants to sit 10 hours in the sun at Pine, at Pine Point, they know what the total maximum is going to be. And at Higgins, they're likely to be paying an hourly rate because they won't be there that long. And the machines so are capable of delineating right. the difference between, you can set them based on a, the, the clock of operation where you could say from 5.30 to 9, we're charging $2 an hour. But as of 9 o'clock, it's a flat rate until 5. I mean, the computer can, can and again, that's just kind of knowing what the schedule we're thinking about in the season because that's where the cost starts to go and our cost recovery starts to to be challenged there as far as what we're trying to accomplish based on how much we're going to charge to get that back. Yeah, I, I was just going to go back to something Tom, Tom said about, um, about if we're going to do an hourly rate um, that we would need to be charging on the way out. So conceivably, we could do something similar to the, to the metering system that's currently on. Um, at, but it would be automated. It would require someone to check. But that would require enforcement. So if the gates right. were just open and, and you'd had to get your ticket for a certain number of hours, Put it on your dashboard. That would require enforcement. That would require enforcement, then, like we're doing on Bayview, and that's right. that's labor right. intensive. That's right. a system option. Then there are, you know, you could have fully gate where you you come in, you push the button, gate goes up, you come in, you take your ticket with you, put your ticket in, it charges you with your card on the way out. Oh, yeah. Or you have that system, but a pay station off to the side to keep traffic moving, depending on how populated it is. So the the system costs go up, but there are there are all those options and combinations based on what we decide for do for charging options and then and then season. I and and just to cover Kate's uh issue, I agree that I don't think there's any reason to differentiate from one beach to another in terms of pricing or hours or season. Uh each beach is different, but they be treated all the same. Uh we have a process that's going to go on over the next several years where we will introduce a system, an electronic system, 
at Higgins because that's what's been uh, uh, what we've uh, uh, put in the budget. Mm -hmm. But the following year, we'll put more money in the budget for Ferry or Heard Park, and then a third year, or maybe both next year. Depending on the system's cost. Depending on when you're cost. talking about a system that's at like baby right now, you're talking about seven thousand dollars because it's run solar, and it's just the direct cost and the transaction fees are absorbed through the the charging. Good. Uh, other point of discussion: uh, when we met last month, uh, we talked about. Uh, Can I follow up with that question? Yes, go right ahead. Um, was that seven thousand dollars annually, or seven thousand dollars for the system? It for costs the, the system. It's seven thousand dollars for the machine, and then it's there's a twenty dollar. I believe. Don't quote me on. I believe it's about twenty dollars a month operational charge, and then there's a uh, like I think it's twenty cents a, a transaction. Um, which is all PCI and gets up into the cloud and then we get, which we're not presently charging for yet, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so. Right. And some kind of paper, yeah. Yeah, you have to pay a third bill. party yeah. person. Uh, for credit card transactions, you will pay a third mm -hmm. party provider mm -hmm. to process those and right. it does get to be a bit mm -hmm. foolish at low, low amounts, those percentages get high. I have a friend that runs a company that does yeah. that mm -hmm. and she makes the hang. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this, um, this schedule, uh, is helpful because uh, the reason the Ordinance Committee really got involved with this was because Todi advised that she starts to sell in February, March, April. Right. And the Ordinance Committee, uh, the Finance Committee, really gets going in, with its votes in the April, May time frame. Right. So we'd like to be able to have this schedule in place. Okay. Uh, uh, the um, non-resident parking pass information that uh, uh, Todd uh, brought us last meeting showed 100 as the low side and 200 as the high side, and the discussion was gravitating around splitting the baby in the middle around 150. Uh, Todd has 100 on here, uh, but now that we have the three of us here, give me, give me your sense of wh where the non-resident should end up. You want to go first? Um, so I'm just looking at, at the, the information that we had in the background. So um, Saco's charging 100, Old Orchard is 150, Kenny Bunk is 200, and then Kenny Bunk Port is 100. Um, I don't think, I, I think $100 is probably a, a nice increase from, from where we are, 150. I don't have a strong opinion either way. I was leaning more towards the 150, to be honest with you, um, for non-residents, solely because I felt like, um, I don't know, I feel like our beaches are a lot nicer than Old Orchard's beaches. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but also, I think that, um, you know, our residents, we pay a lot of money to live here. And it's expensive to maintain those beaches, and we've seen that. We've seen the numbers. Um, and I think it, it's a privilege to go to those beaches, and luckily we live in this town and we have that privilege. And so for me, I, 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 could, I could see the 150, um, but I'm, I'm not steadfast for it. So if you, felt, if you both felt strongly, um, you could easily convince me okay. to go the other way. I will, I will tell you that um, some of these neighboring towns uh, limit the number of out-of-town passes. Right. Correct. Others limit the uh, use of their out-of-town passes or people holding out-of-town passes during the heaviest periods like the 4th of July. Uh, I feel as if well, I, I have a, it's a bit of a parochial feeling, but I would prefer to favor Scarborough residents. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, I think 150 makes sense. It may mean a few fewer people uh, uh, get a pass, but that wouldn't bother me from a revenue point of view because it means that maybe more Scarborough residents are being able to get in before the line stops, as it does, at all three parking lots. At all three. 
I guess I'd, I'd like to take a slightly counter view that if so right now if we if we have a daily parking fee of ten dollars you know it's roughly you know if you if you buy a season's pass and you're an out-of-town resident you, you make your money back in eight eight visits right um, cool. if we jump to 150 it's now 15 and we might see more uh, use of the day yeah. today pass so, you're, that's um, a good point. so uh, maybe we consider doing both I, I think our daily parking fee might be also on, on the low side um, when you look at again the comparison to the other towns, Wells is charging twenty dollars. I was just gonna say, could you give me a like yeah. a rundown, a quick rundown of what the di I didn't, I was, I missed yeah. that meeting. Yep. So it would be like it's it's in the yeah. it's in the online packet, but uh, right now um, Scarborough is ten dollars. Uh, no information for South Portland Saco. Old Orchard is listed as private. Wells is twenty dollars per day. Okay. Uh, Kenny Bunkport is twenty five dollars a day, and Kenny wow. excuse me, Kenny Bunkport is fifteen dollars a day. Kenny Bunk is twenty five dollars. Okay. Right. Todd, have you looked at the question of uh, the daily rate in just comparison to the, the stats that I gave you some of the towns that don't have listed uh, I couldn't confirm whether they were private or not private because in those rates fluctuate depending on season and time of day and weather um, the reason why I didn't make a proposal for the daily fees was I just couldn't come up with a good solution yeah. for not impacting our residents mm -hmm. um, as far as our goal I think we talked about was not right. increasing that yeah. fee and so that's why I left those two alone as far as a daily. So. And point being, we don't differentiate between resident and non-residents. On a daily. Whoever you are. So, that's right. why I think that'd be really difficult. Right. Yeah. Show us your registration. <laughs> However, yeah. our receiving pass is fairly, fairly reasonable. I don't, I, I wonder how many people, how many of the $10 fees are, are residents versus not. Yeah, I've always uh, thought that a, a fixed fee uh, for people who really only intend to you know, sunbathe for an hour. That's the limit of sun that they can they can take. It seems a little unfair, which is why the metered system, uh, based on hours, seems to me to be uh, or segmented. Right. Uh, on the daily fee, though, to me personally, ten dollars, whether I'm there five hours or two, is still not an outrageous rate when you think everyone else is charging twenty and twenty-five or thirty. Right. And so to me, that. That yeah, yeah, that recall, fee is although there's there. only what 11 or 13 of them, but we do have short-term parking at Bayview for that short-term use. Whether okay. an hour is enough for true. people to do mm -hmm. what they want to do is right. another question, perhaps. But yeah. that's true. We did that really so to provide for provide that. flexibility. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I don't think the ten dollars is outrageous for somebody that's there at two hours or it's so a great uh, deal. Be there multiple for the new system, electronic system you're not going to have any longer uh, uh, a, daily, a daily rate unless it's a not to exceed number. That's an option, yes. That's an option, yes. I mean, you could have, uh, we still haven't delineated, that's why I kind of hear what the options are, whether you have hourly rates before you keep your designate in the, middle, in the middle, or the third option is you have a flat hourly rate that you charge throughout that time frame with a maximum not to exceed X. And so, uh, am I correct that at this point you haven't really settled on what, uh, how to go? Correct. That's why I brought all this information to kind of see what the best, because again, my feeling is to be able to set up a system that when we get two years down the road and we have meters at other places, we can uphold that across the board, right. um, whether that's gated, metered, um, combination. So. Um, yeah, I had not given any thought to the fact that you could say there's a minimum that you're going to spend here, and it might be like a two-hour fee, which might be five dollars. Correct. Uh, so you're that's that's the minimum, but it's an hourly fee. If if, if two hours was five dollars, it's two fifty an hour. They're off. Seven fifty. Right. For ten dollars after four hours, but then it maxes at ten dollars. Right. And again, or, in point of, in or, number higher. or it could be a higher figure. Right. And just for point of conversation, something to consider, and the reason why the hourly, I'm still not completely set on the hourly myself, is that I would hope most residents would, would take the season pass rate uh, avenue and, and get, the, get the lowest rate possible for the season. So again, we're talking about daily users giving them a better deal. Right. As potentially, like you just said, potential, the higher percentage is probably non-residents. Hmm. So again, why are we doing this? Why are we putting in a mirror? Why are we adjusting the fees hourly? Again, what's the why, what's the why behind the whole reason we're doing this? If we're driving, mm -hmm. trying to keep rates low for residents, mm -hmm. encourage them to do seasons passes. Everything we're doing, 
I mean, and it's an option, is for potentially benefit well, the non -resident. I must admit, initially when this when we first conceived this, I was thinking that we'd have staff savings, and I've come to realize that that's really it's not going to be appreciable. We'll still have to clean the restrooms. We'll still need oversight and people to yeah. and to be there for problems. So mm -hmm. there might be some marginal savings, but it's not going to be eliminating those seasonal staff members. Yeah. No, and if you're extending the length of day, you may actually have to add staff to have people there. And season. I mean, and season. Right. So that those are both issues that are going to have to be taken into account. Correct. So, it, it, you know, Todd, it, I've encouraged him to kind of ask the question of himself, and he's kind of throwing it back at you, is let's make sure we know why we're doing this. What mm -hmm. are the benefits of this approach as, to, as, to, as opposed to the mm -hmm. simple, mm -hmm. traditional way we've done it? Um, what kind of timeline should we be thinking about as far as, sending this to the town council as a revised schedule? Well, I think you're quite right that uh, we historically, our budget schedule is such that we're already selling season passes for months, frankly, before the fee schedule is updated. So I think season passes need to be in place by uh, end of January, I would say. Um, the other ones can wait a bit longer, I suppose. Is that, is that your okay. question? Yes, exactly. And, and, and trade, I'm not sure, but our, on our shellfish and mooring licenses, those run till June 31st, June 30th, is that correct? So again, one consideration with this fee schedule, not to, you know, in lieu of, is potentially, can we look at a whole year so that way these are done? We may not be able to happen this year, but for future considerations, could these schedules be set by the end of a current year so as we make those licenses and mooring fees and all that stuff for a complete calendar. So you're year. talking a calendar year, right? As far and as setting up, so we're looking year, at so because we're on a fiscal year now of July 1 to June 30. Correct, and we track things by month, and you know the months can be delineated as far as revenue mm -hmm. goes. But um, it's that fishing license we're presently right now. And the reason why I bring it up is we've just recently sold three peer use licenses that are theoretically good till June 30th. So I just so if somebody comes in now not to cut you off. Somebody comes in now to buy more. They're mm -hmm. valid until June 30th and not this increased rate. So that opportunity. And once we set this and we say they're good February 1st, I see potential for an influx of people coming in. Whether we hold sales of these now, what do we do to kind of not get bombarded by the the offloading as Biddeford and Saco have kind of pushed so us into? I just did some just ran some quick numbers rounded numbers. So for a resident beach parking pass, we're at $40, right? So I bumped it up to 50 For a resident for the second pass, we do it at $5. I bumped it up to $10. Non-resident passes, we are, we're at $75. I bumped that up to the 150 that we talked about. That comes out to 150000 versus the 96000 we made last year. So those slight tweaks, you know, yeah, yeah. Potentially have more than 50 percent quite a quite a big impact. Mm -hmm. Assuming the numbers are good enough. Right, and yeah, uh, yeah. right, and obviously, my my hunch is they will go down a little bit. You know, like you said, like people yes. might do today mm -hmm. instead of. So we may see the non-resident numbers go down a little bit, but I still think, it, you know, we're in a position. This town is in a position where we're, we're, we've got to find revenue. We've got to find mm -hmm. more revenue. Mm -hmm. Um, if we're going to keep funding all of the things that we want to keep funding at the level we want to fund them at, we've got to find ways to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't like to raise fees. I don't like to, especially with our residents, I don't like to gouge anything anywhere. But I'm very concerned about next year's budget. So any little thing that we can do seems like we've got to find something somewhere. Yeah. Uh, or maybe something to think about. I don't know. No, I'm not trying to sway anybody. I'm just saying it, it was surprising to me what a difference it makes when you when you just bump things yeah. up even just by a couple dollars. Yep. When we're talking about the amount of people that use our beaches. So um, Tom's indicating that we should probably try and conclude a schedule that would be a collaborative effort with 
the director of community services uh, by the end of the year. Uh, but uh, we're probably not looking at a calendar year uh, implementation. At this, at this point, uh, something to consider with the fee cycle. I guess, uh, and I, the question I would have is, is there, a, if, is there an advantage to turning this into a calendar year as opposed to a fiscal year? I was just going to ask you that. I was just what, exactly what, is the, what is the advantage? To me, the only advantage I see is when we set our fees, it's, it's, it's we set our fees, and but they're, the, the, some of the commercial passes are still being at the old rate. So when they buy it again, they're really getting an extra. The issue is really in the transition year. The first year of the yeah. MCs, we may lose some money, uh, but 12 months is 12 months, whether it's June to calendar June. July to June or... So if we adopted this schedule uh, before December 31st and had it be applicable on January 1st, while we would have sold, I guess we would have sold uh, parking passes and mooring fees to people who believed they were good through July 1 of next year. Yeah. Kind of got to be on the flip here, I think. Not par parking passes. I, I think those are uh, the peer use and the mooring fees right, might those be are caught in that. All right. But right. that's not huge that. money, frankly. Right. Comparatively. So but we, yeah, we could make it work and then check. But we would want to make the parking pass. Yeah. Applicable to the 2018 season. Right. Sure, and I think you could yeah. do that because yeah. we don't sell them. We're not selling them now. We won't sell them till when, Tracy? March? Something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that still even works if you make shoulder seasons and make it earlier and later, too. Good. Uh, then I guess uh, we'll uh, continue this. Yeah. Uh, Todd will continue to work on mm -hmm. uh, an overall plan for the parking lot. We've certainly weighed in on the beach pass in the, I guess, $150 range. And I can report uh, back after my meeting um, with the waterfront and um, coastal waters and shellfish committee on their feelings on operations down there and fees and that sort of stuff. The one thing I do, did want to know, you see in the green there, our question marks on a daily fee for RVs. Yeah. I put question and dollar amount. Presently we're charging $35. Um, some places don't allow that during a hot season right. and some charge a lot more and I didn't have a, you know, just want to put a point of conversation that that's something to consider because um, presently what we have, especially at Herd, is you'll have RV show up prior to charging. Some are in and out, some do, some pay, some get chased. Uh, and that also happens at the co-op as well. So the real question is do we want to prohibit RVs from from our parking right. lots. That's, that's really the question that we have. Is that uh, uh, by ordinance? Is that the way in which it's controlled? That's a good question. Hmm. Um, I, I, would think it would I don't know the be. answer to that. Yeah. Did we charge for parking at the at the co-op? No. 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 Right. One <coughs> of the, not for a whole other sub, but one of the considerations we're looking at at the co-op is. Um, and part of my main is redesigning that parking lot. We have a, a third row, which is pedestrian parking, that we're looking at expanding, uh, potentially trailer parking as that need grows there. Um, and then there'll be considerations and choices to what we do for parking, whether it's pass parking, whether they're charging, that sort of stuff. So, yeah, the Coastal Waters and Shellfish Group is very interested in those issues because that's mm -hmm. where they most of them function out of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have much opinion about the rest of these. No, no, no. You don't need to answer that now, but uh, if uh, what would simplify this immeasurably, and I don't know how we'd actually, where we have to make that change, is if we want to prohibit RVs from our parking lots, that would simplify things. Well, I, I think that should be uh, addressed, uh, and if it's an ordinance issue, we probably okay. want that as a point of discussion uh, at a future meeting. We have. Uh, okay really November and December to uh, uh, to bring this uh, to a conclusion and see if we can by the first of the year have it wrapped up and, cool. and push to the uh, town council.
Could Good. I just try to recap so I make sure that Todd and I have kind of general marching orders? When it comes to the automated system, the preference is ultimately to treat all beaches alike and yeah. that if there are hourly fees and or total maximum fees, they mm -hmm. would be the same? Is that fair? Okay. Yeah. With, with the understanding that obviously if we have a system at Higgins and we don't have it at Herd, then yeah, uh, right. That's what we can do until yeah. it's price correct. Okay, and then there's uh, we'll research the three or four different options to accomplish that. But that's helpful, just knowing that's the expectation. Yep. Yeah. And uh, is there a uh, consensus that uh, we'd like to see Todd explore? Uh, extending hours and ex ex extending days. And just for a little more clarification, are we thinking that we're looking at a whole because I can calculate some potential revenue gains or not too, but are we talking about thinking about like a, a May 1st to an October? Are we talking about normal season with shoulder seasons? I mean, the charging schedule kind of falls into what do you think a preference would be in looking at that? Yeah, I think that's probably what we're talking about is uh, uh, adding May and adding September. But I don't, I don't know if we're talking about extending it through October or April. April. All right, let's we'll consider that. And we'll consider you, would there be any differential for those children months? Would it be cheaper for May and September, or you want to keep it simple, keep it the same? I think we're going to face a whole, I mean, I think if we change the, the whole, if we change um, that schedule, I think we're going to hear about it. Yeah, for easy yeah, administration I, and understanding one flat rate, yeah, I, I think charging. simplicity would be the same rate. May, May and September, I don't think I would go into April and October. No, I wouldn't either. Okay. Uh, and l last, um, to extend the hours to start charging earlier and later each day? Yeah, kind of daylight hours. I, yeah, I think we need to. Good. Uh, it's certainly earlier. Yeah, I don't agree with that, but you, it, well, but you guys, yeah. I mean, I And, and I, I, I think it, spre it spreads the cost, yep. which keeps the, rate, the hourly rate down. Well, yeah, I, I guess given that we have to staff it, I don't know that we're necessarily thinking that it's going to be necessarily revenue neutral. I think I'm just more thinking, or excuse me, that we're going to make significant money from it. Um, I'm thinking more along the lines of the fact that people show up at 9 o'clock and Higgins Beach is full, the parking lot's full of people that didn't pay, um, and that right, somehow right. we need to be capturing, capturing that because that's not fair. Okay, good. That's helpful. Thanks for the direction. Appreciate it. Good. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, uh, defacing carts, and I put it on the agenda. What what topic did you want to speak to? The oh, good. Uh, yeah, please do. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, April Hill, 14 Maple Avenue, and I had already sent an email, but my concern is, is especially after hearing about once an ordinance is enacted, like there is no grandfathering, is that I have two um, Animal Welfare Society stickers on the top of my trash and recycling bins that have been on there for two years, and when I heard about this uh, potential ordinance, I went outside and I found that even if I wanted to remove them because they've been baking in the sun, like they're on there really good, so I was kind of panicking, but then kind of a little annoyed, like why am I, with everything going on in the world for all of us, you know, like why is this an issue at all? And so I just wanted to voice that and, um, and hope that if it does move forward that I will not be uh, a criminal and <laughs> face a fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, w I did want to just put it on the agenda just uh, because uh, we have a public hearing and then a second reading and I wanted to, uh, and uh, we took the opportunity this week to try to answer questions that had come in, and you all 
saw the oh, yeah. the uh, response that uh, I provided yeah. uh, based on uh, my own initial efforts, Tom's review, and both of you having the opportunity to uh, input uh, and uh, some editing did result, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but I uh, uh, I thought it was worth us taking a moment to at least reflect on this. The comments fall mostly into uh, it helps me with identification to have some signature element to my barrel, uh, a sticker uh, or whatever. Right. And uh, we've accommodated that by uh, a provision in the ordinance that says you can put your address on it. Uh, uh, and so we, uh, uh, there is no difficulty of identification problem when people raise that. I think we've addressed it. So uh, may I, can I ask you a question? Sure. So like take April for example. She has those two stickers on the top of her cans. If she takes like a black sharpie and writes on those two stickers her address. I think she's good to go. That she's legit. Yeah. Yeah, I must admit we are, I'm not going to invest staff time and effort you know, driving up and down town roads searching for violators here. Right. To me this is yeah. not, no, it, 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 it's, it really is not a big deal. And if somebody just put their address uh, uh, where those stickers are, you're good. No bail bondsman need apply. <laughs> <laughs> my my concern with it was that um, it it came out of um, the complaint came from one person, and it was a political complaint, and that really kind of bothered me a little bit. Um, because it seemed like a lot of people were up in arms over this. We spent 25 minutes at a council meeting talking about it. And like in the back of my head, I'm thinking, we just lost three budgets. And I was, <laughs> we're sitting here for 25 minutes talking about trash cans. Right. And it was like maddening to me. Yeah. And I, I'm getting all these emails of people like freaking out about their trash cans. And it's like, right. okay, what, what, what do we do? Why are we doing this? Um, like I, I understood that one. The one side of me was like, it's it's town property. Right. But then when I asked the question, I think Will and I talked about. It, I asked Will the question of during the council meeting, like, so say I had a couple of stickers on there that my kids slapped on there or something, um, and I sell my house, and that that trash can that goes to the person who buys my house. And my neighbor calls in a complaint because I left a Trump sticker on there. They're, they're going to get fined. They might not even know about it. So not necessarily. I, we will be using discretion, but uh, this came. It just seems silly to me. The, the complaint came was fairly isolated. It did have to do with a uh, political ide ideology, I believe, but. Uh, it was an opportunity for us to say, wow, we don't have any means of addressing this in the current ordinance. And so, uh, yes, it was a single, singular complaint, um, it, but just imagine hypothetically if someone put, painted swastikas on, on the barrel. Currently, we have no recourse. And I know that's not occurred, and it's probably extreme, but this is more precautionary and protection. Just in the event we need to take action, we have authority to do so. And uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to follow it to the, the letter of requirement. And I know for some people that's a problem in and of itself, that it's selective, but that's the reality of our staffing resources. Avril, did you have the opportunity to see my responses to uh, Susan Hamill's questions? I did not. Because no, I tried to lay forward. out. Do we forward it to her? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll forward. Thank you. And there was a whole, bu whole does it make comprehensive sense to, list of for the public's benefit to, to simply go through them quickly? Yeah. Question and answer? Yeah, I, sure. yeah, I don't have yeah. it. I have that. It's right here. The questions are highlighted. Your responses Great. Are below them. Uh, uh, the first question was about uh, 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 the same question that you had asked. 
that you use your stickers for identification in, in part, and she asked that, and we noted that address identification is permitted, no size limitation or manner or method of placement is imposed by the ordinance. So that's uh, something people are free to do. Uh, uh, how will enforcement work? Uh, uh, we responded by saying we intend to notify the public of the new ordinance through the newspaper and the town's website and Facebook page. No special outreach is intended by DPW. Homeowners will be expected to comply on their own accord. Uh, will there be a fine? Uh, the ordinance states that the principal recourse is replacement of the barrel at the owner's expense. The cost of a barrel to the town is $45.88. The ordinance also reserves the town's right to pursue fines under Chapter 601. Uh, will Public Works uh, come around and inspect uh, the barrels? And the answer is no. If a violation is reported to Town Hall, a phone call to the owner is expected to suffice. Uh, has Public Works weighed in on this change? The answer is yes. Mike Shaw made the recommendation that led to allowing residents' uh, addresses be placed on carts. Will the town require homeowners to purchase a new replacement bin just because the existing bin has stickers on it, uh, but is still perfectly usable. Uh, the response was, circumstances may vary, but we expect that most homeowners will be able to remove stickers with a little solvent and elbow grease. Will public works clean the bins? The answer is normally no. Will the town act only upon complaints? And if so, wouldn't that be unfairly discriminating against First Amendment rights if political stickers were selectively targeted. The answer we provided was that the town will respond to complaints, whether it involves stickers exclaiming, uh, quote, Heil Hitler, or, quote, Thomas the Tank Engine. There are no First Amendment rights when defacing town property. Uh, the next question is, how will homeowners be treated who place stickers on their bins before the ordinance was changed, and will those bins be replaced? Uh, the answer was that this was uh, covered above. Uh, uh, there really is no grandfathered status on this. It's intended that people would, uh, if, if, if it was brought to their attention by the town that they were out of compliance, then they would take action to get into compliance. If enforcement is not really going to be done, why make this change? The response we provided was the town has lots of ordinances that are not aggressively enforced for lack of manpower, lack of priority, etc. And the town often relies upon complaints to prioritize enforcement. Uh, that's, I think, all her questions. So there you go. Any other discussion? On, on it, uh, I think the uh, the, the sense at, at the town council meeting was that this public property, uh, and we're uh, trying to avoid having uh, political messages, uh, like electronic signboard kind of uh, things turned into trash carts. Uh, we've got a sign ordinance so that if you want to send a message, great. Uh, in your case, decorating it with something you feel strongly about and putting your name on it, I think is totally, totally appropriate. Address. Address. Yes, yeah. address, right. Anything else? Good. Uh, identification of next agenda items. Tom, do you want to review? Yes, uh, we'll be coming back with the affordable housing in lieu clarification language. Mm -hmm. um, special amusement is moving on at this point. Gender neutral, we hope, uh, we'll actually we won't come back assuming that we can get clearance from legal that uh, there's a simple way to do this all at once. If it's something other than that, we will bring it back. Um, I expect Todd and I will have some further updates on the parking passes and fees and, and the like, so we can keep that on if you like. And just yesterday, staff began the process to look at our mass gathering ordinance. 
I'm not confident we'll have a, a, a draft worthy of your review at this point, but that's mm -hmm. something that is coming down the line. Uh, we just see some improvements that can be made to streamline the process. Mm. So uh, beyond that, I'm not aware of any other uh, matters pending. I think probably it sounds like, given that as uh, our next agenda, that sticking with the November schedule, that we, rather than trying to seek a, a different day, I know Kate had a problem with one of the days we suggested. Yeah. And so. I think I can get back in time for four. So. I, I, you, you think so? Oh, good. Yeah, then, you then, need it. Yeah. then I. Uh, I think holding them on that schedule will put them in advance of each, uh, as opposed to being the day after right, yeah. the town council right, meeting. Right. It would be a week or 10 days in advance. So, yeah. okay, we'll go with uh, October 26th or 8th? I thought it was the 26th. Let's take a quick look. Uh, the 28th. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 26th. It's the 26th. 26, so that'll be the next meeting. Yep. Uh, any other business? Let's accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. In favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just, uh,